Hey, everybody. How are you? Welcome to the Nooner with Dave Lamont. And I'm a few seconds late because I made an editorial lighting decision to try a different angle in my home because there's a lot of sunlight out here being Southern Florida. And it was a little goofy looking over one of my shoulders. So hopefully this is a better look for you uh, in the Casa. A uh, lot to talk about today. If you can read this, that's what I've got for notes. This is the handwriting that got me held back in sixth grade from recess, which really made me mad, Mrs. O'Neill. But um, it hasn't gotten any better either. So I showed you. But yeah, there's a lot to talk about today. And you know what? I'm pretty happy with uh, with all of it. I really like what I've got to say today. Really excited. And one of the things I teased was uh, on Facebook, if you missed it, NBA action is fantastic. Not. Well, it is fantastic right now. The part that's not fantastic is there are no fans. Just a little pun, a little play on words, a little goof. But I have to tell you, I've watched of the post-pandemic or current pandemic sports that have come back, I've watched the NBA more than any other. Now, part of it is, obviously, the Miami Heat are an interesting team, although, whew, second half yesterday was a absolute stink job after a brilliant first half where they seemingly couldn't miss a shot. They missed a lot of them in the second half and got beat by a Milwaukee team that Miami had previously done very well against. So that's a downside. You had the Lakers and the Rockets on. You had the Mavs on. And I love watching the Mavs. My son interned there. They're a fun team to watch, although they lost to a very, very good Clippers team. It has to be considered a title contender. So the whole thing to me is fascinating. And i tell you what I do like, and I'm surprised. And I'm sitting there watching, I think it was the, the end, or early in the Laker-Houston game. So it was the third game I'd watched yesterday. And I said to my wife, I'm not minding the artificial people and the artificial noise. It feels like a game. I've gotten very used to watching these games in a short amount of time. And that's surprising to me because I'm a fussy son of a gun about these kinds of things. And, you know, I'm a purist. I would be happy if I would go to a hockey game, for example, and three seconds after they blow the whistle to stop play, 50,000 watts of music wouldn't come in and drown out any potential conversation I was going to have. Or I don't necessarily have to have walk-up music at a ball game. I don't necessarily have to have defense, defense chants at a basketball game that are artificial, not created by the fans, but I mean created by whoever is in charge of game noise. But yet, I am okay with this approach. I'm okay with the pseudo-fans. I understand now the NBA is, is uh, putting tweets from fans on these screens during player warmups. Smart move. So this NBA experience to me has been a gigantic positive. And then you find out, I forget which game I was watching, the uh, sideline reporter, courtside reporter, mentioned about what NBA players you know, have the ability to call a hotline number if they feel somebody is ratting out on them or ratting on them. Not, let, me, let me start that again. They can call a number if they want to rat on someone. That's better. If they want to say, hey, player Z just broke a protocol, you know who they're calling? They're calling the commissioner. They're calling Adam Silver. Now, I don't know if Adam Silver has a short list of like superstar players that have his cell phone number. Or if the 10th guy on the bench who plays five minutes, if he's lucky, is able to dial the commissioner of the NBA and go, hey, three doors down, there's a guy with a girl in his room and it's not supposed to happen or whatever is going on. That to me is unbelievable. I seriously doubt there's many NFL players who have Roger Goodell's number or many people who have Rob Manfred's number who are players. Now, stars, that's one thing. You want to know what your star players are thinking. I'll guarantee you LeBron James, James Harden, guys like that who are powerful spokesmen for the game, they have Adam Silver's number. But I am dying to find out if everybody does. And if that's the case, it's just another reason to like Adam Silver and the way the NBA has handled this. And they've handled it beautifully. 
They're still clean and positive tests, as is the NHL and Major League Soccer, and I believe the WNBA is also clean. So all of this bubble thing has worked beautifully. And that's why I read yesterday on the Twitter, as the kids call it, the possibility of college basketball, just the big conferences talked about this, very, very preliminary, trying to play their season in a bubble. Which is fascinating to think about because where do you do it? Orlando can do it. Do you bring, do you again use Disney? Because if you're not familiar with it, and, and there's two buildings where they play basketball. So you can play a couple of games in a building, clean it up, clean it out, and keep going. You can play all day if you wanted to. You know, I'm sure there's all sorts of disinfecting protocols that are going on there and everything. It's the perfect setup for basketball because you can just go and go and go and go. So do you do that for college? Can you find something like that? Or do you go back to Disney if you're, say, the SEC or the ACC? Where does the Big 12 go? You know, Dallas? Could they pull it off in a place like that in a big city with tons of hotels? Or do you put it in one spot? Do you have a location? Houston is a huge city. What about the, the medium conference? Remember, college basketball is a hell of a lot more balanced in power than college football is. So the American Conference is pretty close to a power conference. The Mountain West, pretty close to power conference. Yeah, I'm prejudiced. Go Pokes. But you could. can you do this? Because if you can, I would be calling Adam Silver right now and going, hey, buddy, can you, uh, you give me a few tips on how to do this? Because it seems to be working rather spectacularly. So good on the NBA. I'll continue to watch. Uh, the one sport, I, I watched some hockey over the weekend. I haven't caught up to baseball yet, but the good news is Somehow, after being pretty much down to about one beep left on their lifeline, Major League Baseball pulled it out of their ears and through some creative scheduling. And I'd like to know, meet the people, the person or people who came up with these schedules, because those people need access to Rob Manfred's vacation home in wherever he has one. He should give them the key and say, leave the place messy. I don't care. Have a great time. Drink all my booze. Whatever it is, you may have saved baseball for this year. It's always possible there's going to be another mini or major outbreak. And somehow the team most affected by it hasn't lost since they came back with literally a patchwork of stratomatic cards playing for them. Now, they did beat the Orioles, who were terrible. And I should know, being a fan. But still, it's a hell of an achievement for that team to do that and way better than you would have ever, 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 ever guessed was going to happen. So pretty remarkable, as opposed to what could have happened, where we could have had by, well, shoot, merely by last weekend, but maybe by this weekend, everything going down the drain and baseball possibly being lost. We've had enough baseball lost in our lifetimes through labor disputes that we don't need one through a pandemic. If we can squeeze this season out, it would be miraculous. And we may point to this period in early August where the miracle occurred. Now it's going to be, and look, as much as everybody seems to hate Rob Manfred, he's right about one thing. It's the players have got to crack down on themselves. And if they need to call Adam Silver, let them call Adam Silver. But the players have got to discipline themselves better. One more baseball story, and I'm chuckling, but it's not really that funny. Did you see what happened with A's coach, Ryan Christensen? Have you seen this video? So baseball is doing their damnedest to eliminate the high five for this year. I mean, they're not going to suspend you, but they're, you know, it's the old Bash Brothers from the Oakland A's, the early McGuire, Canseco days, that kind of thing. They're trying that. Dave Henderson, he was a good ball player, by the way. Um, well, if you look at the video, and I, I don't want to accuse them of doing this on purpose, and I'm not going to replicate the gesture. But let's say if you're a World War II aficionado or a student of history, it's a gesture you don't really want to see from the mid to early 1940s that came out of Germany. I'll leave it at that. And he kind of did it. And then somebody apparently said something to him like, hey, uh, <clears throat> Ryan, Ryan, Ryan. And he did it again. And he has apologized. The A's have publicly apologized. And whether he gets a, a sanction, a suspension, uh, or whatever, I don't know. Don't know what they're going to do to him, if anything. They might, you know, the humiliation might be punishment enough in this case. 
and the realization that he's you know put himself in the news cycle and uh you know it's it's a bad move it's a bad look bad look for everybody uh quick couple of comments yes rob hockey is going on uh paul believes that hockey well i've got two polls who comment hockey is doing it better than the nba because basically hockey jumped into the playoffs the nba invited 22 teams in and they're doing a play-in for the last spots. I'm okay with that idea. I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, they both they did it both differently. They're both extremely successful. Both concepts work with me. Paul, who's from the Chicago area, says, if you're going to do this, the Big Ten, what about Chicago at a convention center? There you go. You could do it there. Chicago certainly has the space. So why not? I think Indianapolis is another place that could do it. And already the Big Ten uses Indy quite a bit. You could, uh, you're, there's certainly, and, and well, you can't do it with fans, unfortunately. But I think Indy, Indianapolis, Chicago are great choices for the Big Ten. Kansas City maybe for the Big 12 or St. Louis. This can be done if it has to be. On the football notes, 66 NFL players have opted out of the season. And almost half of them are linemen. Now, some have very good, I mean, well, they're all, look, they're all good excuses. If you don't want to catch a virus in a flipping pandemic, then don't play football. That's fine with me. I will never criticize anybody who backs out. Some have had existing health conditions. Some have children uh, with conditions that make them vulnerable. So if a parent comes home infected, that could start an entire downhill negative run in the house with, with health. So you don't need any of that. So it's interesting, the biggest guys, the guys who are physically the most at risk, particularly if they're a little heavy and they're not just ripped, um, are copping out. That's fine. It's not a cop-out. It's an opt-out. College football yesterday, and this is a bad break for the University of Miami, but their absolute first-round pick defender, Gregory Russo, left after one year. He's going to get drafted, folks. And he was going to get drafted whether he played the season or not played the season. And with the virus and the risk of injury that comes with playing football anyway, Russo, and I don't blame him either, walked out. Why not? And if you end up playing college football in the spring, which I really hope we don't, you're going to see a ton of guys who are draft a bowl walk away from college football. And if they're worried about getting, and they can, you know, finish and get their degrees if they so choose to do so. Or what some guys are doing, some are graduating early and then going into becoming a pro athlete full time by signing with an agent, which Rousseau's already done with Drew Rosenhaus, uh, and doing it that way. Or you just start your training and you find your agent and you go to one of these training places, but we don't know what that's going to look like. Imagine those places have taken a financial hit as well. But some universities are practicing, not hitting, but practicing, drilling, whatever they can do. I just saw some video from uh, North Texas yesterday, just randomly going through Twitter. So, and also in the college front, there's now a new hashtag, MW United, which sounds like a soccer team, but it's Mountain West football players who are jumping in with the Big 12 and the Big 10. And although there's not an SEC United, you may have heard about a very awkward phone call a week or so ago involving SEC athletes and people trying to tell them, hey, it's going to be fine. Don't worry. When you hear that, come on, you worry. By the way, speaking of hockey, the Panthers have taken the ice against the Islanders in their second elimination game. And they won the first one. If they lose today, they're gone. So it's, uh, it's harsh what the NHL did, but I'm either one, either one. I'm just happy to have it. I'm happy that I can flip on the PGA. I don't have to have 30,000 people crowding the fairways and some idiot yelling mashed potatoes anytime somebody tees off. I'm happy that and it looks like a good field and you've got some top players and you've got Bryson DeChambeau and Brooks Kepka with their little feud. Wouldn't it be cool if it came down to them? the final couple of holes to see the mental game that goes into it. Cause DeChambeau is all about the mental part of the game. And he's kind of a geek as far as all this stuff goes. And Kepka, you know, doesn't seem just seems to be impervious to this sort of thing. 
And yeah, he hit a shot in the water the other day and lost to Memphis, but he was playing boldly. He wasn't playing scared and just didn't execute. And that happens even to the very best. You don't always execute perfectly. So you've got that. And by the way, Bryson DeChambeau didn't do himself any favors yesterday by swinging so powerfully that he cracked the head of his driver. Now, you can crack the head of your driver if you smash it on the pavement or smash it into a tree, but just swinging the club isn't going to help the steroid rumors. And I'm not saying that he's a roid guy. I don't know him. He bulked up big time, but that's not normal. If that driver was 20 years old, yeah, I'll buy that. I'm guessing Bryson DeChambeau's driver was fairly new, recently manufactured. And I doubt it got beat up in his trunk and, oh, that's what happened. No, it's not going to help. Hey, the guy shot a two under anyway. Tiger shot a two under. Not bad. Conditions for him, I would think, would go against him, but that's very good start. It looks like a good finish coming up. Last I checked, there was a, a player at six under par early, but there's so many guys that get the tee off, so I'm not going to get too excited about that. Something I, I really wanted to mention, um, and there's two more items uh, that I wanted to get into before we work on our vocabulary item for today. Uh, all congratulations and the happiest of huzzas to – Retired University of Miami baseball coach Jim Morris, who was elected to the College Baseball Hall of Fame. That announcement came out this week. Now, that wasn't a suspenseful phone call, but it had to be made. Jim won almost 1,600 games, over 1,000. I think it's 1,090 while at Miami. 13 College World Series. His first six years at UM, he went to the College World Series. And I was there in 1999 as an announcer when the Hurricanes won, so I got a ring out of the deal which was awesome. And then he won two years later in Omaha. And when you get to 13 College World Series, that's hard to do. Last few years, yes, things tailed off. And his assistant, Gino Damari, is in charge of the program. And it appears that Miami is, is fighting their way back uh, to top-level status that they used to enjoy routinely. But for Jim, he really, really deserves this. And I am delighted uh, that I was part of the Morris years for four seasons. I went to the College World Series as an announcer four years in a row. It's my favorite event of all time to attend in person. That was the old stadium, Rosenblatt Stadium. The new one they have, by the way, is utterly beautiful. And Omaha, underrated city. I'm telling you that right now. Love it there. So tremendous uh, for Jim, tremendous for the University of Miami. So uh, kind of a mixed bag with Gregory Russo leaving for football, but apparently the recruiting is coming in, but call me when these guys start to produce. But for Jim Morris, an honor extremely, extremely well-deserved. So there you have a successful coach who's going in the Hall of Fame. In Lubbock, Texas, Texas Tech women's basketball just got rid of theirs. Marlene Stallings, two years, she recruited – she lost, what, 12 players in two years. Seven of them she recruited. They transferred or quit. And if you read the articles, yikes. There was apparently, an, according to these articles, an obsession with a 90% heart rate in games, and cardiologists have gone, really? That's pretty hard to do. But they put it up on a board, and there was a photo of a board, and if you achieved it, great, you were going to play. And if you didn't, no, not help it. Lots of talk of, of verbal abuse, talk of a strength coach that may have been inappropriate. He resigned in March, by the way. This is just another example of players, who, and a lot of this damage came from players in exit interviews, not with the coach, but with the athletic department. And at first, Kirby Hocutt, the AD there, tried to defend her. Then he really realized what he had, what he had on his hands and fired her. So, and this is a woman who had had success at two other schools, who had turned programs around. Texas Tech women's basketball, unlike the men's program, had taken a bit of a hit. But it's telling me also the players just aren't, this, this isn't the 50s and 60s, where players just let coaches run wild. Players are, are, are pushing back. 
They're pushing back now in college football. They're pushing back in other locations. And if they, you just can't scream and yell and rip a guy or a woman like you used to. There's got to be a point to it. Yes, coaches get mad at players. Of course they do. And if you do it right, it can be done well. If you're just constantly abusive, what's, what are you doing? Are you teaching that athlete anything? Are you truly coaching them? Or are you just taking out, just yelling at them because you can, because you have a whistle around your neck and head coach on the website? Players are fighting back. They're not going to stand for this. So it'll be very interesting to see what Texas Tech does, whom they bring in as a uh, soother. Generally, you know how that goes. You have one coach who's either a player's coach, that doesn't work, or that person leaves, you bring in the, the hard ass, and then you reverse it. So we'll see what happens with, with that. But I thought that story was very interesting because my first thought was it's a different era for players. The player-coach relationship, that dynamic, a lot of it has changed. Some of it remains the same. But players are not going to put up with it. And, and by the way, Texas Tech was doing pretty well. They were improving. Doesn't matter. You don't do it the right way, you're gone. Um, our grammar for today is one that we go back to the Department of Redundancy Department. And this one, oh. All right. When I used to do uh, morning radio, at WINZ, WIOD, working you know, for then Clear Channel, which is now iHeart, I had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Not 4 a.m. in the morning. What time does this show start on the East Coast? Noon or 12 p.m.? Not 12 noon. And I didn't get to bed last night at 12 midnight. I got to bed at midnight. 12 noon, 12 midnight. That's all over the place. And I have said it. it to me, it's, it's, it's the same category as when the very first one I did with billions with a B. Since there's no other way to spell billions, you don't have to say it with a B. And since noon is not 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock, <clears throat> it's... 12 o'clock, and noon means daylight. Midnight means darkness. So let's say we all link together and eliminate the 12 noon, 12 midnight, or 2 a.m. in the morning. Now, I understand that. We know where that comes from. The fact that you can't believe that whatever it is you're talking about is happening at 2 a.m. What time did you get in last night? Oh, uh, 2 a.m. in the morning. Whew. Or, I heard a noise outside my house at 3 a.m. in the morning. What is going on out there? Is it a raccoon or is it a burglar? What's happening in my neighborhood? Dave used to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning? Why, yes, I did. So let's work on that, okay? 12 noon out, 12 midnight out. 4 a.m. means 4 a.m. Have you ever said 10 a.m. in the morning or 4 p.m. in the afternoon? It just seems like the early morning hours carry such a shock value that we don't believe we're actually conscious while we're doing it. Programming note, we have had a lot of talk about college football, only for me. On Monday, I'm going to fix that. ESPN's Rini Angolia is going to be our guest, assuming, again, things work. And uh, Rini will offer up his perspective on how the players are handling the pandemic, how he thinks the coaches are handling it. And would he play, because Rini was an excellent player at UMass, Literally, Rini is on the Hall of Fame, College Football Hall of Fame ballot, and I have voted for him, and I hope he gets in one day. He was tremendous at UMass. Um, and I, I want to ask Rini's opinion. Would he play if he were 20 years old and had a chance to play now? And does he think that we're really going to have any kind of a college football season, even a truncated one? So that'll be Monday on the Nooner with me, Dave Lamont. As always, free to subscribe on YouTube. I'll post this show if you missed it a little bit later, uh, missed some of it, want to see the whole thing. I certainly appreciate all of your support. I am sponsor-free at the moment, sponsored by no one. Let's see if we can fix that out there. Some of you own businesses. 
I don't think I'd be charging terribly much. And of course, I'm on Twitter at Dave Lamont One, Instagram at Dave Lamont, and obviously, you know where you can find me on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you very much for watching. I really enjoyed it. I felt like I had a lot to say. Let me take one last lap here to see if there's anybody. And yeah, and Phil points out, and I did think about mentioning military time, Phil. I really did. And if you don't know military time, they don't mess around. It's 0100 is 1 a.m., 0200 and so forth. The, what, the, the thing that confuses me is when you get to like 2200, I have to stop and think that that's 10 o'clock. So that's maybe why I'm not the biggest fan of military time. But yeah, that solves all their problems. There's no 12 noon in the Army, the Navy, Marines, Air Force. What a great place. What a great place to start. That'll do it. I'll see you Monday at noon Eastern. Rini Angoli will be my guest. And until then, have a great weekend. Watch a lot of sports. There's a lot out there to watch. Hope you enjoy it. And I'll see you on Monday. Thank you.